Hello, and welcome to Tell the People, a program about our Catholic faith with news and information in and around the Catholic Diocese of Lafayette. I'm Trista Littell, and in today's show, Ashton Mouton will be here talking about a prayer service for those in Syria and Iraq who have been persecuted by ISIS. Father Michael Russo is here in the segment, What It Means to be Catholic, talking about following the call of the shepherd. And in the segment, a conversation with Bishop Michael Jarrell, Monsignor Richard Green interviews Bishop Jarrell about World Day of Prayer for Vocations. But first, Catholic news on this April 26th weekend. April is recognized nationally as Child Abuse Prevention Month. Since 1986, Prevent Child Abuse Louisiana has dedicated to accomplishing one mission, preventing the abuse and neglect of our state's children. In the Catholic Diocese of Lafayette, effort to support this cause on behalf of Bishop Jarrell, the Office of Safe Environment is providing to every diocesan entity, mainly churches and Catholic schools, a blue bow and sign to be placed in a prominent location for the month of April. As we travel our cities and byways and view these blue bows and sign proclaiming April as Child Abuse Prevention Month, let us prayerfully ask God to bless successfully this endeavor by protecting our children through diminishing anger in adults and others who care for children. We would like to thank you ahead of time for your commitment to child abuse prevention. Members of the community of Jesus Crucified are conducting a silent retreat for women that will inspire and challenge you to fall deeper in love with the Lord. During the retreat, you will have quiet time to pray, opportunities to celebrate the Sacrament of Reconciliation, Mass, Adoration of the Eucharist, and free time to stroll through the beautiful retreat center grounds. Because the community wants to place no obstacles in the way of those who truly want to make a retreat, the retreats are conducted free of charge. Please make sure and bring a Bible, paper and pencil, pen, toiletries, towels, and washcloths. The retreat will be held May 1st through May 3rd at Our Lady of Sorrows Retreat Center located at 103 Railroad Avenue in St. Martinville, Louisiana. For more information or to register, call 453-2385. The 2015 Mother's Day of Reflection, sponsored by the Office of Marriage and Family Life, will be held on Wednesday, May 6, from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. at St. Edmund Church Hall, located at 4131 West Congress Street in Lafayette. This year's presenter will be Patty Schneier of the Archdiocese of St. Louis. Since October of 2003, Patty has been speaking at parishes and Catholic conferences across the United States to share her personal testimony. Patty has also been a guest on various Catholic radio shows, including Covenant Network, Ave Maria Radio, and Catholic Answers Live. The retreat will include the celebration of Mass, as well as lunch and supplies for the retreat. Pre-registration is required. Due to limited space, registrations will not be accepted at the door on the morning of the retreat. Register online at www.diolaf.org. The registration deadline is now. You are invited to a Theresian birthday bash. Last month, the Carmelite Monastery in Lafayette celebrated the 500th birthday of St. Teresa of Avila, and now the Community of Jesus Crucified continues the occasion with a series of lectures honoring St. Teresa of Avila. There will be five lectures on select upcoming Fridays beginning at 7 p.m. They are on May 8th, an introduction to the life of St. Teresa of Avila. Then on May 15th, the book of her life. And on May 22nd, the interior castle. And moving on to June 12th, the lecture will be The Way of Perfection. 
And the last lecture, June 26, will, will be about other writings of St. Teresa of Avila. The lectures will be led by Father Michael Champagne at Our Lady of Sorrows Retreat Center, located at 103 Railroad Avenue in St. Martinville. There is no cost for the lectures. For more information and to register, call 337-394-6550. The Community of Jesus Crucified continues its summertime events by hosting a silent retreat for men. The retreat will address the call to holiness and reflect upon the means provided by the church to become real men of God. The retreat will be led by Father Michael Champagne at Our Lady of Sorrows Retreat Center, located at 103 Railroad Avenue in St. Martinville, beginning at 7 p.m. on Friday, May 29th, and ending on Sunday, May 31st at about 3 p.m. There is no cost for the retreat, but register early as space is limited. For more information and to register, call 337-824-3045. KLFT Catholic Radio for Acadiana is broadcasting weekday noon mass from St. John Cathedral in Lafayette. The 12.05 noon mass is aired live on 90.5 FM. This is a wonderful opportunity for you to hear the Word of God in Scripture during lunchtime. In addition to daily noon Mass, KLFT Catholic Radio for Acadiana is airing the Sunday 11 a.m. Mass live from St. John Cathedral. KLFT 90.5 FM also airs this program, Tell the People, on Fridays at 1 p.m., Saturdays at 8 p.m. and Sundays at 8.30 a.m. and 10 p.m. Please tune in and support KLFT 90.5 FM on your radio for Catholic programming for Acadiana. And that's Catholic News for this week. Coming up next, Ashen Mouton will be here talking about a prayer service for those in Syria and Iraq who have been persecuted by ISIS. Thank you for joining us today, Ashton. You're welcome. So what is the purpose of your visit today? Well, we've been concerned about ISIS and what's been going on. And a Ger German um, news reporter named Jordan Todenhofer, who's 74 years old, who's been reporting on wars for 50 years, says this is the largest religious cleansing that has ever been planned in history. That is just amazing. Well, what is your parish, St. Pius X, doing uh, with respect to the ISIS crisis? We're planning a prayer service that's going to be held on May 18th from 6 to 7 p.m. in the church. We're also going to have Eucharistic adoration while this is going on. And Eileen Desimo is going to be showing uh, a video also, which will enhance people's awareness of what's going on with ISIS and the persecutions that are happening. Ashton, why prayer? Why prayer? What a good question. We all need to pray. And prayer is power. And right now, we need God's power to diminish the results of what's happening, what ISIS is doing, the martyrs that are dying, the people that are fearful, and the refugees in the thousands that are being you know, moved away from their homes and are living in fear. And so as fellow Christians, we need to have compassion for those that are suffering, and our response of action can be prayer. Well, how can our community benefit from a prayer service for issues going on in the Middle East? Well, you know, it, it all comes back to that where two or more join together, I'm there. And so we're calling upon Jesus, and, and he will let us cooperate in the mission of salvation by our prayer by our efforts, by our actions, 
by telling other people about it, by asking other people to pray. So as we come together as a community, we fight with prayer. That's our weapon, the Blessed Mother, you know, and Jesus. Absolutely. Well, if I were someone watching at home, what would you say is the reason I should attend that service? Well, people's hearts are disturbed. We've all been reading in the newspaper. We've been seeing it on TV. And people are wondering, what can I do? This is something concrete you can do. To be a disciple of Jesus means we should act. Not just, you know, receive, but we should act. And God is calling us to act, and our act can be prayer. So by coming, you're showing solidarity and an effort to relieve the suffering that's going on in the Middle East. Well, for someone who is unable to attend the prayer service, what can be done? Well, you know, anyone can go to adoration. We have numerous adoration chapels here in the diocese. You know, St. Pius has one. You can call our office to get our code. Um, Brobridge, St. Bernard has an adoration, perpetual adoration chapel I'm talking about now. Um, Father Champagne at the Community of Jesus Crucified has perpetual adoration chapel. Or you can just go into any church and pray in front of Jesus and the Blessed Sacrament. Pray the rosary. We also have, which is interesting, a Carmelite nun. And her name is uh, Blessed Mary of Jesus crucified, who is now beatified, but on May 18th, the day before our prayer service, will be canonized by Pope Francis. Well, surely special graces are going to be dispensed. That's going to be the day after her canonization. Exactly, Trista. I mean, how exciting is this, huh? God is giving us a saint from the Middle East to pray to for her intercession for all this suffering that's going on. So, you know, God is giving us what we need and the encouragement to pray. Sure. We still have a couple minutes, Ashton. Is there more you'd like to share? Well, not only, you know, in terms of adoration, but we pray the rosary. And people have their personal prayers. Whatever they are, you know, when you're praying your personal intentions. Uh, some people pray the Liturgy of the Hours. Some people pray novenas, like to St. Therese or to St. Joseph or whatever. Include you know, prayers for the Middle East as you're praying your own devotions. And, um, and really reach out to others as disciples. You know, not only come yourself, but talk to your family and your friends. Bring your children. Teach them something about the importance of prayer. When we have crisis in the world, when we have evil, what do we do? We fight. And so prayer is the way we can fight. We need to pray for our public officials and the leaders of the world to intervene on this. It's like Nazi Germany. We cannot let Hitler continue to, to do what he was doing to the Jews and to the world, taking over these countries without stopping him. You know, we have just war principles. And the Catholic Catechism talks about that. And so I'm not saying that we should go to war against the people that are doing this, but certainly there are times when war is justified, as it was against Nazi Germany. And if this is going to be as bad or worse than Nazi Germany, which was horrible, we have to begin to pray and, and, and ask our leaders to act to stop this. And Our Lady has, in the past, always intervened asking people to pray the rosary. Absolutely. It's such a powerful weapon. It absolutely is. Well, Ashton, I can't thank you enough for joining us today. It's always a joy to be with you, Trista, and uh, to proclaim God here uh, through the diocese and tell the people. Thank you. Coming up next, Father Michael Russo is here in this segment, What It Means to Be Catholic, talking about following the call of the shepherd. Hello, I'm Father Michael Russo, pastor of Our Lady of Fatima Church in Lafayette. Sheep are some of the most fragile animals in the world. They cannot defend themselves, they easily get lost. To find food and water, they must be led. And even then, they cannot always distinguish between healthy and harmful grass. 
for survival sheep depend almost entirely upon their shepherd. And thus those beautiful words of Jesus, I am the good shepherd, and I will lay down my life for my sheep. The idea of a shepherd giving his life for a sheep seems absurd, but Jesus is saying to us that this is exactly how absurdly wonderful is God's love for us. He just loves us that much. And yet we look at crucifixes all the time, but do we really know the depth of its lesson that Jesus gave his life for us? And so the question becomes, how can I love you in return, Lord? Because love wants to give. But what can I give you that you don't already have? I know I can love you by loving those you put into my life, every one of them. You love them, and so you are within them. And when I love them, I am loving you, Lord, the Good Shepherd. There's another side to this. I know my sheep, says Jesus. The Good Shepherd knows us by name. More and more, our urban landscape is being observed by security cameras. Google Earth even allows us to go online and peer into our neighbor's backyard. Big Brother is seemingly watching everywhere. Now, here's what's so amazing. There are people who have no difficulty believing that one day the government will keep track of us, but these same people struggle to conceive that an all-knowing God can take a personal interest in his children and hear our prayers and be responsive to our needs. Dear friends, no matter how far our technology progresses, it will be painfully primitive in comparison to the all-knowing God. God knows us by name. When we come before him to confess our sins and to express our needs, God hears us and is present as if we were the only person in the universe. If we can believe that science can track our whereabouts, how can we not also believe that God can be responsive to those who call upon him? He really does care for us that much. I know my sheep, says the Good Shepherd, but he goes on to say, my sheep know me. Are we seeking this type of relationship with Christ? To know him, not just about him. To know him, not just with our head, but with our heart. To know him as he knows us, intimately, not just getting by. Throughout our great diocese, there are adoration chapels, many open 24 hours, seven days a week. Thousands of people keep vigil before the Eucharistic Lord in these adoration chapels, yet so many more of us could commit to one hour a week. Why? To seek to know the Lord more personally, to seek to know the Lord more intimately. We all know that we are loved by God, but we need to give God the chance to tell us that. This is why adoration is so beautiful. It's the same with Bible study. There are, for example, thousands of people in our diocese who come together weekly for Come Lord Jesus Bible study programs. It's another way for us to let Christ into our lives because when we do, we lose nothing, absolutely nothing, of what makes life free and beautiful and great. Faith is a life-giving friendship with Christ. It's about loving a divine person. It's about encountering a person. And so, my Jesus, when you created me, you built two needs into my soul, the need to love and the need to be loved. But it's much harder to let myself be loved than to love, because to be loved I have to let myself be known. I cannot be loved fully by someone who doesn't know me fully. This is why all earthly love is precarious. We never really know if the person who loves us will continue to do so when they know us better. But you know me, Lord, through and through. All the things I keep hidden from others. All the things about me I barely understand myself. And you love me as no one else can, without an ounce of ambiguity or reluctance. Do you see the spiritual lesson? Faith is not just about obeying a set of rules. It's about loving a divine person, encountering a divine person, embracing a divine person who taught us to call him the Good Shepherd, the Good Shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. To my Catholic brothers and sisters, 
Make a good confession soon. Come to Mass on Sunday. Hear the sweet call of your Divine Shepherd. And until next time, God love you. Thank you, Father Russo. Coming up next in the segment, a conversation with Bishop Michael Jarrell, Monsignor Richard Green interviews Bishop Jarrell about World Day of Prayer for Vocations. Good morning and thanks for having us in your home. With me is Bishop Michael Jarrell of the Diocese of Lafayette. Bishop, thanks for being with us. Well, it's my pleasure to be here with you, Monsignor, and with all in our audience as well. On the fourth Sunday of Easter, which is today, the Church celebrates the World Day of Prayer for Vocations. And so, Bishop, what is the focus of this day? Well, let, let's begin with a definition first. Uh, a vocation, in the way that we're using it, it means a calling from God in a way that we serve God by a certain manner of life. Now, this particular day, World Day of Prayer for Vocations, refers to vocations to the priesthood, to the diaconate, or to the consecrated life, what we mean by our brothers and sisters. So that's kind of the, the idea of this day, and the focus of this day is prayer for vocations. Okay. It says that in the title, but we should remind ourselves that it's basically uh, focusing on prayer. And why is the day connected to the fourth Sunday of Easter? The fourth Sunday of Easter is known as Good Shepherd Sunday. Um, the Gospel and Mass every year is about uh, Jesus, the Good Shepherd. Now, the Latin word pastor is translated as shepherd. So it has this connection with, um, with priesthood, at least, with, religious, with uh, priesthood and also with religious vocations. Mm -hmm. But it is because of the Gospel on the fourth Sunday of Easter having to do with Jesus, the Good Shepherd. Mm -hmm. And Bishop uh, Pope Francis issued a special message for the day. What did he have to say? Well, he repeated the idea that it is very important uh, that the whole church pray for vocation to the priesthood and to the consecrated life and to the diaconate. So he um, spent some emphasis on the idea of praying to God uh, for his blessings of vocations in the church. Uh, but he spent a good bit of his message talking about the theme of the Exodus, uh, when the people of Israel left Egypt under the leadership of Moses, that was called the Exodus, a going out. And he makes the point that in our theology, our understanding, the people had to leave something behind in order to get to the promised land. And he makes that a metaphor for our vocations, that people who want to pe uh, pursue uh, a religious vocation have to leave something behind. You know, we, we can't do everything in life. Yeah. We have yeah. many talents and many interests, uh, but at some point we have to leave behind some things in order to answer the call of God. And he tells us that uh, we have to learn how to trust God. You know, and I think many young people today have so many possibilities and they're told that, uh, well, you have education, uh, you have the ability to do anything you want to do. And uh, in some ways that's good, but you have all of these choices and all of this freedom and sometimes it is difficult to make a commitment and to leave some things behind. I know a few years ago when I went for uh, diaconate ordinations at Catholic University in Washington, D.C. I was staying in the Religious House Theological College, and in the stairwell, as you got entered each floor of the building, there was a sign when you went through the doors that said, please close this door behind you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I thought that was a beautiful symbol of men who were becoming deacons, but they have to leave other things behind them. So the Holy Father tries to make that point. But he also spends uh, a paragraph or two talking about um, the Blessed Virgin Mary mm -hmm. and how she left some things behind, answered God's call to be the mother of Jesus. And he uses her as an example of that kind of faith and trust in Almighty God. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Bishop, do you think the uh, Lafayette Diocese does well with vocations? 
Well, I think we are uh, doing very well. Um, we see the results, seven priests last year, two this year, and each year a number of young ladies enter different convents uh, to become sisters. We expect perhaps 12 new seminarians next year, our largest class in a number of years. Uh, we may have as many as 48 seminarians. Mm -hmm. That's very optimistic. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a lot of support for religious vocations, and I find excitement among young people in general and many of their families. And I give a great credit to the priests of the diocese. We have many who actively promote vocations, and that's not true everywhere. So I think uh, Lafayette is especially blessed, yes. Is, is this a recent phenomenon? Well, somewhat. I remember years ago, well, twice in my uh, priesthood, I've had men say to me, when I was young, I thought about being a priest, but my parents discouraged me, mm -hmm. and my friends made fun of me. But I don't think we find that as much anymore. Mm -hmm. Now, some parents are very reluctant and very leery, but the more they found, find out about the life of the priest, I think the more encouraged they are. Mm -hmm. So, Bishop, uh, what do you ask of the people of our diocese? I ask their prayer, and I ask them to encourage those who might be interested in being a priest or a brother or sister, especially if they're in their own family. Okay. Uh, Bishop, earlier you mentioned uh, the Pope's message on vocations. Um, how could uh, people get a copy of the Pope's message? Well, everything's available online today, and I'm sure there are multiple ways. I usually go to the website of the Holy See, and you can find there to click on the messages of Pope Francis, and you'll find it. Okay, well, thank you, Bishop, and thank you for joining us. Uh, today, I'd like to conclude with a prayer for vocation, so please join me as we pray. Father, you send us forth to build up your kingdom. I pray especially for those whom you are calling to serve the church as priests, deacons, sisters, and brothers. Help them to hear and to answer your call to discipleship. The harvest is plenty, but laborers are few. Please provide for us men and women who will help to gather in a great harvest of souls. Amen. We'll see you next week. Thank you, Bishop Jarrell and Monsignor Green. Join us next week for another conversation with Bishop Michael Jarrell for what it means to be Catholic with Father Michael Russo and we will have an interview with seminarian, soon to be transitional deacon, Alexander Albert. We hope you have enjoyed our program because it is produced for you. So please join us next week on this station as we tell the people about the Diocese of Lafayette and the good news of our Catholic faith.